This is our first uh, speaker series this year and this semester, and we're really excited. We have a lot of great guests throughout the rest of the year, both semesters, so we'd love to see you come back again. Um, we're kicking it off uh, with a great guest today. Um, a couple orders of business first. I should introduce myself. I'm Sam Johnson. I'm the graduate student coordinator for speaker series. I'm also helped out by Addison Martin. Should wave. She's gonna take over for me eventually when I graduate on time. Uh, so one thing to keep in mind is we will have a Q&A after our guest is done at the end for about 15 minutes or so. So try to keep your questions till then. We'll pass a mic around so we can record it on the video. Um, also for students who need credit, we use something called Slido, which of course is misbehaving today. We are gonna try and use it and we still want you to log in there. I'm gonna give you simple instructions to do that right now. Um, you go to, the, also there's these pages here posted on either wall. You go to Slido's website, it's sli.do, Slido. And then it'll prompt you to put in a like code word and those are posted there, and I'm not gonna say it because it's for students who show up, um, but they're posted there. And then in the question bar, we ask that you put your full name, your A number, comma, your A number, comma, the course number you're getting credit for. So it would be for me, it would be Sam Johnson, comma, A0123456, and then comma, LAEP, uh, 1200. So yeah, that's how you get credit. That's how your professor instructor will know that you have attended. Um, so today, Patty Stevens is our guest. She's our prestigious Canyon House resident for the fall semester and has taken on a huge role in teaching this semester as well. She's teaching site analysis one and also assisting in the urban design studio and bioregional studio. These are some really heavy hitting classes. It's a lot, a lot to teach, a lot to take too. Um, and from a couple of people who I've talked to who've taken your classes, you're a fantastic teacher who speaks very eloquently about landscape, which I'm really excited to hear about because I'm not in any of those classes. Um, Patty is one of our own. She received a bachelor's of arts in geography from the University of Cincinnati and then went on to receive her master's degree here at USU in 1981. Um, throughout a 40 year career, she's worked in private practice, governmental and non-governmental organizations. During her time in the private sector, she served as the principal of a multidisciplinary firm providing planning, landscape architecture and architectural services across the country. After she served in the private sector, she became the chief of park planning for Cleveland Metro Parks and the director of uh, capital projects for the conservancy of Cuyahoga Valley National Park. This is a beautiful 50 square mile park that preserves and celebrates the iconic rural landscape of the American Midwest. Additionally, she's an adjunct professor at Kent State University in the College of Architecture and Environmental Design where she teaches site analysis and design. Um, her work often focuses on turning underutilized land into vibrant community assets. She engages art, community, and natural resource experts to create places in which the environment is protected, the ecology is restored, the community is engaged, and a positive contribution is made to the larger system in which the site sits. So we're really excited to have you here and let's have you talk about it, not me. Thank Give Patty Stevens a round of applause, please. Okay, we're on. <laughs> Thanks, Sam. That sounded pretty good. <clears throat> it's a pleasure to be here today. Um, this, he, Sam mentioned, I came from here. This was my foundation. It really launched 40 years. My last 40 years came from what I learned at this place. Uh, I know several of the professors, Todd and Carolyn in particular, talk about this uh, studio culture 
And that is something that, you know, I, I hadn't heard that term that much until I came back and heard them talk about it. But it really resonated with me that I've, I feel like my career has really embodied that approach. I've carried that with me. Um, this is fun stuff. We are the lucky ones. We get to do stuff that other people are envious of. I can't tell you how many people I've come across in my trajectory uh, um, that, you know, how did you get to be that? Oh, that sounds so interesting. Um, there are so many people that have jobs that even though they might like the job, um, they're not really passionate about it. it. It doesn't drive them. This drives us. It's a passion. It's a life's work. Um, I get a little choked up when I talk about it. Uh, and I'm, that's what I'm going to talk about today, is really the trajectory that I've been on. What have I learned practicing landscape architecture for 40 some years? That's hard for me to believe that it, it has been that long. Um, Cleveland, and there are a few people who are familiar with um, this landscape, Dave Evans is an Ohio native. Are you an Ohio native? Ohio, yeah, yeah. yeah. And um, somebody in one of my classes, actually, we picked favorite sites and they picked an Ohio site. Um, Hocking Hills, you might be familiar yeah. with that. But there are great places in Ohio too, although Utah, you know, there's, <laughs> there's no comparison. But this is where I come from. Um, it is a Great Lakes city. It has um, the big, biggest difference in these industrial Midwest cities is these cities have been depressed um, for the last really four decades. Um, growth happens, but only at the expense of the neighboring community. Um, and so coming to this neck of the woods where growth is just, you know, we don't know what to do with so much growth, um, it's a different situation. But I think we probably all recognize that we need to always be thinking about what are the limits to that growth. Um, growth cannot just keep happening unchecked um, and the planet stay as it is. We've already reached the capa carrying capacity of the planet. So it's a Great Lakes uh, city. It sits on Lake Erie, which is really the shallowest of the Great Lakes and kind of a bellwether for the condition. That's one of the largest freshwater sources on the planet. Um, and you can see that those yellow dots are ports. So it's a port city. Really, geography is destiny. Um, there was a canal system that connected Lake Erie to the Ohio River, which is the southern boundary of Ohio, that allowed shipping and connection between the northeast markets, New York City, Boston, Phila Philadelphia, those large markets along the East Coast in the hinterland um, were you know, the breadbasket. So it was that transportation link is really what established Cleveland. Um, we are also on a river. It's called the Cuyahoga River. Um, but it's a very crooked river, hence the name. That's what Cuyahoga means. Um, but these freighters, it's a navigable channel um, designated by the Army Corps as a, as a navigable channel down to where the steel mills are in Cleveland. So these big ships come in and, and unload about five miles downstream um, at the steel mills. We're also, you might have heard of this one, we're the, we're the home base of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And we got this designation in the 90s, I believe. Um, but it really was a citizen's effort. They, you know, they encouraged people to write in to the selection committee and express why Cleveland should be the home of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. We did, there are some historical facts that establish why we think we should have that claim to fame, but other cities sort of claimed the same thing. But it was the citizens effort. So we, are, we have a big fan base, both for sports, lots of sports, but also for rock and roll. So the home of rock and roll. Um, I mentioned the Cuyahoga River. The downtown area sits right here on the Cuyahoga. It's named that because it's crooked. Um, it's an Indian name. Um, and it created these peninsulas. 
which when you're there, we call those the flats. And there's an entertainment district at the mouth of the river um, that has been fairly famous for many years. But as you work your way south down the river, it becomes more and more industrial. And lots of bridges, every kind of bridge you can imagine. Lift bridges, turnstile bridges, jackknife bridges, um, floating bridge, every kind of bridge you can possibly imagine. This is the river that caught fire um, in 69, and it led to the establishment of the EPA, Environmental Protection Agency, in 1969. So that is significant for us. Um, sometimes we think we want to forget about this dark history, but it, that is a huge turning point in this country when that agency got established and we began to care about clean water and clean air. Um, we weren't the only river that burned. We just happened to be the one that got a lot of attention because of a lot of other reasons I won't go into. But this is what the river looked like. And traditionally, what we did with rivers is we filled them in. Not enough fishermen in our neck of the woods, I guess. But we trash and fill, landfill. We filled in all of the creeks. So we have many tributaries to the river system that are filled in and banks that used to look like this. This is actually within um, the stretch of the, that is now a national park. But that has turned around. In the four decades that I've been in this region, again, a grassroots efforts with lots of agency support, um, did something called a remedial action plan. Um, our river was designated as an area of concern because of its uh, water quality. And there was a mandate that you had to clean, clean it up. Um, and we have been successful. It's still got a ways to go. And I've become friends with the people who have worked on that their whole life. Can you, and you know, they're so dedicated to it. But now you can fish and you can recreate on the water. There are times still when, the, when there's been a heavy storm surge, when this combined sewer overflows, which are part of the legacy of a lot of um, industrial cities, um, that you can't go into the water. But those advisories are now fewer and fewer. And it, that information is readily available. So people are, have become, in this time period, really aware and very proud of this transformation. We also now have a national park that sits along the corridor of that river. Uh, Cuyahoga Valley National Park, and I'll talk more about that national park, but it is, Sam mentioned this in, in the intro, 35,000 acres of open lands between the heavily settled Cleveland and Akron cities. It was set aside because of uh, an act of Congress. At that point, it was the National Recreation Area, and there was a movement within the national park system the Department of Interior, to bring the parks to the people. <clears throat> they realized that with um, more and more people now claiming cities as their home base, that most of the parks are in the Wild West, <laughs> um, big land tracts, that bringing parks to places that didn't have access, couldn't travel to those sites, um, was an important initiative of the National Park Service. So it was established in 1974. It became, actually went from a national recreation area to a national park, which is a little elevation in status. Um, that happened in 2000. It's also part of a heritage corridor. And this is sort of when I began to get involved. And what I'd like to do is take you through, so that's where I come from. That's my town. Um, but now I'm going to switch gears a little bit and talk. I think there's three projects here that I'm going to talk specifically about that ha have begun to tell a story, I believe, that there's this thread that runs through my work um, that is beginning to make sense to me. <laughs> it's always hindsight. Um, when we look back, and that's, I really appreciate this opportunity um, to really look back on this four decades of work 
and to see what, you know, what, okay, what did I do? What did this mean? Um, there's a green spot in the middle of the screen there um, that is called the Viaduct Garden. And this was the eastern landing of an old historic viaduct before cars were mainstream that crossed the Cuyahoga River and connected the east and west side. <clears throat> it had a dog leg in it. And so when they tore it down, half of that dog leg remained, but people couldn't make that connection. Um, it's, there you see the western part of that dog leg, still intact, buildings up close to it, but they have events up on top of it, um, and they're, it's, it's a pretty nice space, a good overlook on the city. But people didn't realize, oh, it used to make this bend and land over on the east side. What had happened over there is the land had been filled and turned into a parking lot. So not only did we fill in streams, but we filled in every little corner that we could to make parking. We, we, probably, we might have most parking in the world. But at any rate, the design of this came about through a collaboration with um, a couple of artists, Kate Erickson and Mel Ziegler. And the people in my class, you've heard me talk about this project, because this is the one that really, OK, there's more to this than just design. Not that design, I don't mean to diminish design by any stretch of the imagination, but um, when I started work with this artist team, and they were a, a, a couple, they had been in partnership for a period of time, and their collaboration was so complete it really opened my eyes to what collaboration really is. And the idea that you share and evolve thoughts collectively so that at the end of the day, nobody can say, that was my idea. It really is a, something that is brought forth by a collective. And really listening and, and understanding what somebody else's perspective might be all about. So again, we're talking a lot about collaboration in the studios, but it is key to solving the complex problems that we are facing. Um, the day of single dimension problem solving is long past. At any rate, the design was to basically lay down that footprint of the historic bridge. So you see that big grass panel in the middle of, middle of the, the area. It's a very small little park. Um, an area that was being revitalized with housing. The, the big stones that are floating in that grass panel were the foundation stones for the bridge. And we, had, we didn't know they were there. We suspected that they would be there because they'd be hard to move. But um, it wasn't until we dug down and lowered the, the ground plane that those were revealed. So I thought that was a pretty successful design. Well, the artists, like, nah, we're not done yet. <clears throat> and the tenacity of artists, they just do not stop. They will outlast anybody in the room. And, the, and it's really, I think, you can attribute a lot of the success in public art today to that sort of tenacity that they bring to the table. We began to talk about what this site meant and what we wanted to communicate to the public. And it was about the evolution of this place, how it had evolved over time. Much of the Cidic fabric never is really realized full cloth. It doesn't come into being as a single stroke. But it evolves over time with lots of inputs and lots of changes. It's an evolving thing. So we thought we would label, so we could see those changes over time in the, in the site. And we would label them so people would understand that there was a time difference between when this toast had happened, which was the, the original bridge when it was toasted, celebrated, opened um, in 1878, to now what, what you know, we might be toasting it at again. So again, I thought that was pretty cool. I'm like, I'm on board with that. That's really, yes, we'll do that. OK, still, they, you know, they're not done. It had to be a word that they could research and tie to a single day. So that's, you know, limits the field pretty dramatically. And they did that research. They're the ones that combed through all the records and found the activity that tied to the site that could be tied to a single point in time. 
Again, that was not enough. They went from that to, well, okay, now we, we want this to be done in, and attached to somebody who had some ownership in that activity. So they either found the person who did this, which can you imagine the research that that takes? This is tenacity. Or they found a descendant of that person. So they built in to this effort, this you know, cast aluminum signage, an ownership that would have never, ever existed. So if somebody's grandfather actually had something to do with that toast or had something to do with laying the brick. They might not have even, more than likely, didn't even know that. So it, it just, to me, it was such an eye-opener of how to build a constituency. Because in Cleveland, we don't take very good care of much. You know, we filled in all of those creeks, and our parks don't always look that good. But if you can build a constituency through the doing of your design work, you got something. Because that carries on. There's always a lot of enthusiasm when it's first unveiled, but you want it to live on in perpetuity. So the things that I began to learn from that exercise, <clears throat> certainly about collaboration. And this notion of revealing, the design could reveal the inherent structure of a site without imposing something on top of it. And so that's really a design approach, but it's kind of carried with in many of my projects. This idea of levels of engagement, it's not enough to just have a level of engagement, but let's go deeper. This idea of leftover urban land, and even in Salt Lake and in Logan, there are these little leftover places. Um, I'm working with Carolyn. Um, I can't say I'm working very hard in that class, but I'm listening a lot um, with Idaho Falls. And you just know that these leftover places exist. And how can we begin to knit those together to make a coherent whole, a recreational system rather than isolated little pockets? And this idea of industrial landscapes really began to appeal to me. Uh, you know, I had moved to Cleveland. But I had started out in Aspen for a short while with Design Workshop. So I moved from Aspen, Logan to Aspen to Cleveland. People looked at me like I was crazy. I thought the same thing for quite a while. But once I start falling in love with these industrial landscapes, there was something here. This is something I can sink my teeth into. This is interesting. It's sculptural. It's historic. It means something. And it needs revitalization, restoration. So the easy way to kind of get into that movement um, was to attach myself to what we called a heritage corridor. And this, you see a path running down alongside the river here. This has taken pretty much all four decades to realize. But um, the heritage corridor stretches 100 miles from Cleveland down to a little town called New Philadelphia, which is further south than Akron. And it's a collection of geography that holds together because it has common um, scenic, environmental, economic, cultural, historic values. Um, and it's designated by the federal government, Department of Interior, administered through the National Park Service, but it came with money. So for a good 25 years, we've been getting not a lot of money, but a million dollars a year to implement this as a unit. So things like scenic byways, scenic train, um, a towpath trail that united that whole landscape, as well as the natural environmental ecological functions in that corridor. So it's basically the river valley. So and I focus pretty much in the northern section, which was this industrial area. And what that has been, and it's, we're really just beginning to realize this now as this becomes in place. You would think we, there had to have been at least five different studies done to identify how this, the recreational trail would move through this landscape. Very complex from an ownership perspective. Um, it involved multiple agencies all trying to work together, sometimes not getting along all that well. 
but the perception that it has changed of our city. People up until this point, there are school kids that didn't even know we had a river, didn't even know we sit on a great lake. And we wonder why we have an environmental crisis. Um, but the landscape is so dramatic. You know, that I showed that painting, that artist's rendition um, in an earlier shot. But the, these things exist and are, you know, that you could be in Utah. <laughs> that, you know, I think that competes. Now, and they, but the change in attitude, trying to get our local entities that were working on this to believe in this, to think that this was world class. They would laugh when we'd say, I, you know, these bridges are really pretty phenomenal. This is world, that we could be world class. People would come here just to see this. Um, they didn't believe it, but it's now it is beginning to be realized. And so has really changed the perception. Somebody lost a, looks like a wedding band, <laughs> rolled across the floor. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> So you begin to see the, these design motifs showing up in the recreation of the recreational amenity through this area. This had been a big landfill area that was done to create this clover leaf for the highway system. And it was really the fill from the stadium. So they just re-sculpted it. The land was, it was already there. So the, this is probably the most significant Towpath project that I got to work on is creation of a new reservation within the Cleveland Metro Park system. When they created the Cleveland Metro Parks, it was in 1917, and it was really developed to get workers out of the central city and into open air um, for health reasons. And they created a system that basically rigged the city, but they left the industrial River Valley for industry. So the forefathers sat in a room and decided that industry is too important to us. We cannot give it up for recreational or open space needs, although they were quite enlightened about establishing a park district at that time. It was a, so it was its own government entity, had taxing authority and government entity authorities. <clears throat> so this was the creation of this new reservation called Canal Reservation. And it was backlot American Steel and Wire, Alcoa, uh, Republic Steel, you know, those kind of industries had reserved land along the canal and along the river in their backyard for expansion that never came. So there was quite a bit of land. I think we carved out about 300 acres again a very complicated ownership puzzle to put together. But the place w had all of this infrastructure, grand, huge infrastructure, pipelines, railroad trestles um, that crossed the valley here. Nobody really saw any of this because all the highways were on either side of the valley high, and they didn't, so they didn't really see any of this. So the meaning behind this place really got to be about revealing the infrastructure that it takes to keep a city thriving. And the premise being that because we hide these things away, people flush the toilet and they don't know what really happens. That's beginning to change as we flush the toilet and nothing happens. <laughs> um, but at any rate, so the idea of this place was to bring forward the infrastructure and to celebrate it and not to try and screen it out because we'd never be able to do that even if we tried. It was too huge. And we, we did a visitor center and we picked up on the industrial architectural for, forms in the development of the, the center. And the, the big thing for me was this integration of interpretation. So really integrating. So just like the building had its form was reminiscent of some of the industrial buildings that you saw in the surrounding landscape. We also use some of that infrastructure, um, pieces, parts of it as uh, features along within the landscaping as interpretation. People kind of looked at me a little cross-eyed when we, 
proposed some of these things. But we got an old bottle car. This is, you know, used to take the slag into the steel mill um, and, and had those along in the site so people could begin to understand what all that industry was about. And again, make, trying to make a connection to uh, a constituency. Another project somewhat similar also along the towpath but closer in Akron. Um, there's a series of what's called cascade locks. There's stair step locks. There's 13 of them. Um, Akron was named Akron because it means something in Greek like Acropolis. So, and it's in Summit County. It's a continental divide. Um, so the, the canal had to navigate that grade change. And so there's a series of stair step locks. Um, and again, this was a derelict leftover a piece of geography right next to downtown Akron, right at its front door. But there were people who knew every inch of this, you know, the, these ad urban adventurers who would crawl over this stuff and figure out, well, that was a mill race and that was such and thus. And they began to piece together all of these, you know, odd things that nobody else could make any sense of um, and, and really begin to celebrate that as a sculptural form itself. So that, um, the big thing about this project was it was an assemblage. Um, it was a, a canal store, the lock keeper's house, and the canal were all still together in association. So I didn't know that was a big thing. That's a big thing. To have all of those things in an, the assemblage is what made it significant. Because there were other canal era houses, and there might even have been some canal era stores, but to have that all together in a landscape setting um, was unique. So again, it was this notion of leftover land. I began to you know, be kind of branded as the person to go to when you had a project that, that was leftover underutilized, abused landscapes. And really about not imposing but revealing history. Um, that the design was really about laying back the inherent structure of the place. Um, and the value of citizens. This still is owned and operated by a citizens group. It's been in place now for 30 years. Um, it's right next to national park land. It's right next to the regional park district land. They could easily take it over. But the citizens group didn't want to let go of it. Um, and there's you know, lots of reasons that, we'll, that I don't need to go into. But the value of that citizens group, you know, they, were the ones, they were the ones that went and sat at the city planning meetings when they were talking about, well, we should just demolish all of that and put in you know, a highway overpass. Um, they, were, they were dogged about it. So when I talk about the artists having tenacity, these citizens groups really can be instrumental in making these kind of things happen. So, so about this time, those projects were all done while I was in private practice. About this time, private practice is a tough one, um, at least in the era that I went through it. <laughs> You know, paychecks were not always on a regular basis. You'd get really good people and you'd have to let them go. I mean, it, it was hard. Um, we survived. That firm still exists. It's under a different name, but it still exists today. Um, but I was at the point where I needed a little bit more security. So I went to work for government. <laughs> um, and I had gotten to know these folks through that canal reservation project, and so they asked me to come. They had a, you know, nobody leaves these kind of jobs. The, the previous chief of park planning had been there his whole career. Um, so again, just to mention that Cleveland Metro Parks is known as the Emerald Necklace. There's several park districts that have that distinction and call themselves that. We'd like to think we were the one of the original ones. But nevertheless, um, you can see the green connected parkway system. And it really was designed for carriage rides out in the country. Um, but they left that center area completely void of any um, open space because of its value as industrial land. 
So when I first went to Cleveland Metro Parks, my first assignment was to look at this opportunity. It was called West Creek. And there was, this, again, a citizens group that had sa saved this land, about 400 acres, <clears throat> not far from the downtown area. And they had become very attacked. A lot of the kids had grown up playing on this land, um, having building forts and riding mountain bikes and doing archery clubs. And they started doing cleanup and they, they started to organize. And they, it was right about the time that watershed science, really watersheds, became something that we were aware of and talked about. And a lot of agencies like EPA, Department of Natural Resources, began funding watershed initiatives. And they particularly liked these citizens groups who did the cleanup work. So they became really a strong group. Um, and they came to Cleveland Metro Parks and said, hey, we've saved this land. When they voted, they passed a, a levy they, to tax themselves. And this is in one of the a very blue collar, not wealthy um, part of town, very densely settled. Often, you know, first generation kind of immigrant families moving out from the core of the city to tax themselves, you know, to pay additional money every year to protect this land. It had been a landfill, so there was a big meadow in the middle of it. It happened to be high ground, so it was used for transmission towers. And you can see it was relatively high to the downtown area. You can see the downtown skyline um, there. So this really illustrates the density of that surrounding landscape. So lots of little tiny bungalows on little tiny lots um, backed right up to this reservation. It's called Parma is the name of the community. If any of you remember Drew Carey, um, probably before many of your time, um, that the place where that was set was in Parma, Ohio. So the thing about this one is it, so the reservation sits in the, that red zone. That's an elevation map. Um, we're just going to start learning about that in my site analysis class, so pay attention. Um, it sits in high in the watershed, which began to mean something. Okay, what the, what does that enable us to do? So we started asking questions. What does this situation that we have enable us to do? Um, and this map on the right side shows the street network that backs up to the reservation. So there were all of these streets. The that magenta color is the top of the watershed. So anything on the other side of that flows someplace else. But everything on the inside of it flows to West Creek. So it became obvious that we could begin to control the inputs into that stream from those residential streets. Here's a, just a little blow up of that, how you could begin to, and you know, there's maybe only 30 houses on one of those streets. So that would have runoff that would fall on their roofs, down their driveway, into their gutter system, and then down the street and into the, a tributary that fed into West Creek. West Creek's an impaired stream. Not many fish of any value. Um, so the notion was, can we restore an urban stream? Lots of people are working on it. Can we do it? How, how effective can we be? You know, everybody thought we could do it, but nobody had really done it. You know, so at the same time, the sewer district, which is a huge public agency that um, was trying to become a stormwater utility. It had been enabled to do sanitary sewer, treat sanitary sewer for a large region around Cleveland, but did not, had not acted on what it believed it had the authority to do with stormwater. Well, we had been built out. Stormwater was beginning to be a problem. Things were flooding. There was a lot of sedimentation that was going into the system, the streams, making its way down 
to the main stem, the Cuyahoga, and then we had to dredge it, which cost a lot of money. The Army Corps used to do it, but then they were saying, we're, you know, we're out of money, we can't do this anymore. You have to do it yourself. So, you know, all of those things compounding uniquely situated this property to begin to address something. At, at the same time, this is just serendipity, but at the same time, the Cleveland Metro Parks hired a new chief of natural resources. His name was John Mack, and he had come from Ohio EPA. He was a wetland scientist, wetland ecologist. And, you know, he looked at this and in an instant said, well, this is beautiful. We could have scientific studies. We have matched pairs. You know, Patty's talking about it, like, well, look what we could do. <laughs> and nobody's paying any attention to me. He says it. Everybody's like, oh, okay. John Mack says. Um, so it was really, you know, we asked ourselves when we started working on this project, what is this land uniquely situated to do to contribute to this community, given the time, where our culture is, giving its geography, giving the invest, given the investment of the, the citizens who so cared about it. Cleveland Metro Parks um, really wasn't all that interested in these citizens groups, in all honesty. They were kind of a thorn in your side. You know, you have to pay attention to them. They re require a lot of care and feeding. They're always quirky. Um, no offense to anybody who might be part of one of those. God bless you. Um, because this is how it happens. And the really beautiful part about all of this was we could ask the volunteers to go knock on doors and say, hey, you want to put a rain garden in your yard? Hey, you want to do a retrofit? Um, and they would respond so much better than if a government officials come knocking at your door saying, hey, you want to do this? So it was really a win-win-win all across the board. Um, and it really answered for me this question. And I remember going into a public meeting, and there, it was, there was some tension when we were talking about this park because there were people who liked to mountain bike that had set up mountain bike courses on the property. There were archery clubs. There were dog walkers. You know, everybody had their own special interests, and they all saw those as competing. Um, I can remember there was a ton of research done on do, do, do mountain bikers do more damage than hikers? Well, come to find out, it's, <laughs> it's a pretty even split. Anyway, so, but what changed the dynamic was asking the question, what are we uniquely situated to do to contribute? And when we started talking about that and exploring that with the people, it, the animosity went away because now we're onto a larger thing, something that can contribute, that's positive, that has potential to it. And they could see that. So it really was about asking the question, how do we put function back into these urban streams? This, you know, this is incised. That stream's supposed to be up way higher. <laughs> and again, we did a watershed stewardship center. The idea here was to put the natural resource people that are embedded within public agencies like Cleveland Metro Parks with the volunteers. So they have information that they can, can make that actionable. Um, and, we, and so there was a volunteer center in, in the stewardship center. Um, there's a lot of educational features. The landscape was designed to intentionally reveal the stormwater treatment throughout the site. So they call them treatment trains. So, you know, it enters way up in the upper right hand corner of the screen and progresses in and around the building, through the parking lots, and down into a series of wetlands. And so each one of those 30 management techniques is highlighted, made visible, and interpreted so people could see it and understand it and see how it was functioning. So we, you know, is it worth doing? This is just a little diagram closer in around the building of how that treatment train works its way around the building. And the plaza in the back, you see there's a the downspout that empties into a runnel 
that is, you know, a design feature across the plaza, but focuses that, that stormwater to the landscape adjacent. The beauty of all of this is it's really cool to see it in storm events. So, you know, people usually stay away from these places when it's raining, but people are out here because, you know, with their umbrellas because they want to see what happens when it rains. So that was the whole design intent of the landscape meeting, was again to reveal that function. Um, the inside of the building had interpretive exhibits in it. This is a large scale topographic model that was basically a whiteboard that had a projection on it that allowed us to manipulate it to show uh, volunteers, the citizens, and officials what the difference between the existing conditions. If we took some of the pavement offline, if we, you know, some of the obsolete parking lots, if those had become more porous sur surfaces, what would happen? And we could begin to demonstrate that. We could also begin to show if we're making improvement, which is so much of what happens is in these kind of initiatives, people don't really see the improvement. There, it's small, incremental, but if you can begin to reveal that, those improvements, they buy into it a lot more readily. So this is just the backside of that building and how it led to these, these are man-made constructed wetlands. And again, we had an artist involved and you know, this, I'm, sometimes I have to be really subversive um, and I had the opportunity to kind of put the team together. So I kind of snuck the artist in, which in, in the end, result was kind of a, uh, it wasn't the smartest thing to do because then she wasn't really respected. Like had she been totally vetted and been brought in openly as part of the process. But nevertheless, it, you know, it was a learning process for me. But she began to just see this whole treatment train. She called it metabolism, site metabolism. And she just began to do research to show us how some of these things that we wanted to sh highlight, you know, where is the catchment? Could we, in the landscape, show a catchment area through plantings? You know, that's what that second little vignette is demonstrating there. So she was instrumental in just um, opening our eyes to the possibility and that she, she was so adamant about meaning, that artists are about making cult cultural meanings visible for people. That's what art is all about, making meaning, cultural meaning visible. So she just, you know, kind of drilled us on that one. And it began to sink in for me that, it, you know, that this, we were looking for a meaning and how do we express these meanings. And because everything we do has meaning and expresses meaning. We're just not aware of it. It's not intentional. Oh, let me, I don't think I can go. So the, up, up there, the vocation of place and story of place, if you're in my site analysis class, you've heard me talk about this too. But this whole idea that places have vocation this was the project that demonstrated that to me. You know, and we had asked the community, what is the vocation of this place? And that's the thing that they rallied around. I just, I really like thinking about it that way. I haven't had near than enough opportunities to really pursue that notion. Um, the next 40 years will be devoted to that. So the very last thing that I worked on was for the Cuyahoga Valley National Park, I was, actually paid through a nonprofit friends group, but embedded in the Park Service staff. Um, I think you've probably heard through other speakers that the National Park Service is woefully underfunded um, and their staffs have been reduced, 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 reduced over the years and they just really didn't have the capability to do this on their own. Um, so it, and here's a, a picture of it sitting between Cleveland and Akron and some of the shots of the, of the, of the scenery inside the park. And this was about developing a new visitor center. So there had not been, it was established in 74 and there were lots of visitor places people could go and get information, but not one central welcoming front door orientation place. 
So this property was private property. It came to be available. Um, it, it actually included three buildings and a train stop. Um, and so my, the last big thing that I got to work on was the, de the design and improvement of that uh, cluster of buildings. And I have to say it's the hardest thing I ever did. That there were so many clients, so many people to keep happy between the friends group who were paying for it, the park service, the, you know, all of the partners um, who were actually paying for the, you know, had donated money. At any rate, and it, it was a complicated, it was a historic building, so it, you know, had to fulfill all that criteria. We had to raise it up to get it um, so that it could have a basement to house the mechanical and electrical equipment. It was next to a railroad, um, an active rail line that was a, a scenic rail line within the park. And it had interpretive features inside as well. Um, this one is just really all about orienting people. Everybody got lost. And it was so interesting to me that the Park Service, um, they really didn't believe that. I mean, people would come up to you as you were getting from your car to go into your office and ask where to go. That's a sign. <laughs> um, but they had all grown up here. So they, I'm sorry, I just put my, <laughs> um, they had all grown up here. And, you know, as I mentioned before, we're a shrinking city with not a lot of transplants into the area. So they knew where they were going. What's the problem? But as we became better and better known, as our population begins to turn around, that's not always going to be the case. And so convincing them that they really did need a single point of entry, an orientation place, was a big part. And this project has, has manifested that. Um, so there's, again, there's the topo model in the middle of the floor. It's oriented the right way. That was a big fight to, you know, you have to have north, north. <laughs> and you have to hold to your guns on those silly little things. Because so many people say, oh, nobody knows the difference. They don't care. And so this is a, a, a mural that shows the Cuyahoga Valley and Cleveland and the skyline to the north. The, mo the model's here. It's the topo model of the valley. It's oriented north. And behind me, south, is a mural of Akron. I think that helps people understand where they are. We should do a little user survey to find out if it worked. Has a, a store in it. It had been a company store. This was a paper mill originally. Um, not the building. There was a paper mill across the street. This was the company store for the paper mill. Um, so we used a lot of that um, kind of motif in the design of this with the exhibit designers. But these are a series of activities. So we wanted to orient people to know what they could do in the park. Um, and these would show they were on uh, triangles that spun. So they would have a historic picture of what, say, the river looked like in those previous photos that I showed you, and what it looks like today, and what we're aspiring for in the future. The point being, we are still in process. This is park is not done. We are still working on it, and we need you. So that, you know, we took advantage of the view right out the window to the river, and then, you know, what to look for to show, what shows us that a, a river is healthy. So again, it was an assemblage, which there was so much fear that, oh, it'll be overcrowded. Well, this is a sleepy little place. We don't want too many crowds. We don't want them to stay here for very long. Heaven forbid they should stay here. <laughs> so. The landscape was done in a way to kind of allow for people to meander and gather in multiple places and could handle a big crowd. The notion that that's a design problem. You're worried about too many people. That's a design problem. I can design a solution for you. Um, and I think they began to believe that with this. We also incorporated an, uh, a new shelter, which is uh, reminiscent of a barn that had been on site. You can see I used those same pedals, bridge pedestals that the park actually had a whole stockpile of those. 
So these are the things that you know, I learned from this project. Again, this value of partnering. This could not have been done just by the federal government. It took a citizens group. It took a friends group. It took private donations. This was all private money. The National Park Service played for the parking lot. The idea of integrating interpretation and this notion that projects can change perceptions and really change the center of gravity. So I don't know if you can tell this, but that's me in the middle 40 years, 45, 45 years ago. So that brings me full circle back to this place, which really gave me the foundation for that work. Um, and I have to tell you, it's such a treat to be here um, to have this opportunity. I have to give a shout out. Uh, Jan Streifel, a long, lifelong friend who um, I met here 45 years ago, still a friend. Hopefully you all have, some of you have met her or will get an opportunity to meet. She had a private practice in Salt Lake City um, as a landscape architect. And uh, she's the one that told me about this opportunity. She is such a champion of this department. It, and there are all kinds of people out there who are champions of this department. This is, this is unique, I believe. I mean, I've not been exposed to that many schools, but I've been exposed to Kent and Cincinnati, University of Cincinnati, Ohio State. The camaraderie, the joy that you all share um, all the time. I could see it on your faces. It, makes, it reminds me of how I felt when I came here and what I took away with me. So when I, just a few more slides here, but when I, when I started to uh, respond to this, so you had to do an application, so to write an, a prospectus. It's like, what the heck am I gonna, how am I gonna do this? I'm in Ohio, this is Utah, what do we have in common? So I happened to find the website for the Gateway and Natural Amenity region initiative that Jake is so instrumental in. Um, and it's like, aha, there is a commonality. We have gateway communities. We have a national park. We're having trouble with the, these small little communities and the, the sort of the tension that exists between the federal agencies that run these public lands programs and the local communities. Um, so that became something that I could begin to latch myself onto. And we haven't really figured out a way to, to turn that into anything, but I'm, I'm still hopeful. Um, the other thing that I've discovered, and I'm using this as a class project, but um, the, the Bear River Heritage Area, there's basically a, a massacre site up near Preston. And it's part of this Bear River Heritage Area. And it's part of the headwaters to the Salt Lake, the Great Salt Lake system. Um, you know, beautiful, primarily very rural area. That when I see this, I can't help but think, you know, somebody someday is going to be wanting to put a housing development in the middle of that. Um, and what can we do to preclude that? What does this mean to us? What can this place uniquely contribute to the world today? And they're already doing it. They've got restoration projects going on. They got a big grant through the Bureau of Reclamation. Um, the Department of Natural Resources here is working on a restoration for beaver habitat and, and converting some of the agricultural land back to native grasslands that will conserve water, that will impact the Great Salt Lake. So I think that's kind of self-evident what this can do to contribute. So I hope all of you take a little something away from that. And that's what I Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, a couple quick things I forgot to mention before we take a couple questions. We are having a reception upstairs in the common studio with refreshments and snacks. If you want to come after, just stick around. Um, and also, I forgot to thank our musician today who introed us, Tanner. Can we give him a round of applause, please? Thank you, Tanner. Appreciate it. Man.
And yeah, we'll just do we'll just do a couple questions and then we'll we'll get upstairs for a drink and a snack. Anyone have any questions they want to ask? Yeah. This, this is an amplified. So yeah. Okay, I'll see if I can talk loud enough that you can hear me. Um, but a lot of what you do and like the premise of your talk is about sense of place, and um, I'm curious maybe a couple qualities that you've noticed in your projects over the last 40 years that really get people excited and make these places that you're designing at that third place and give them ownership over those kind of places. <laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> But then drilling into that, how does this place come to be? But then geologically, how does this place come to be? But the patterns that even geologically show up in the soil information begin to repeat themselves in how we build our highways and how we build our communities. And if you begin to understand those processes, You can begin to see that those relationships between those elements, and that's that's a sweet spot. Hello. Uh, this is oh, okay. Uh, what exactly is uh, viaduct? Because I know you were talking about the viaduct project, and so I just wanted to know what if you could explain exactly what it is. Because it's definitely different than an aqueduct. So oh dear. <laughs> I was, not, I was just curious because it looked like an aqueduct. I think it but. means that it carries, actually, I think the legitimate term is it carries water. Mm -hmm. um, but that one was called a viaduct. It didn't carry water. It carried transportation. Yeah. Um, it's basically a bridge. Mm -hmm. But I think it has to do with how it was built, those arches. And it had, a, it was, had one structure on one end and another structure on another end, and the center was yet again a different structure. So it, why, one, Todd, do you know the answer to that? I have a question. <laughs> uh, first of all, it's so amazing to have you back. And what took you so long? <laughs> okay. And the work's so impressive. And um, I'm interested in you responding to, you spent most of your time in your life in Cleveland in the Midwest. I can relate to that. You spent a, sh a chunk of time out here. What did you get here, other than the specifics of this program, that you took back there that made you effective? What What did the West, the experience in the West, give you in your career back there? I'm sure tonight, as I'm drifting off to sleep, I'll come up with the perfect answer to that. <laughs> but um, one of the things I think is the idea of landforms. And, and even in cities, there are landforms. Um, my very first project that I showed, I can remember, you know, I'm this young punk kid, and I went to a planning meeting, I was nervous wrecked, because they were gonna build a building there, and I was like, you can't put a building there. It's the only place where you can see from the river into the public square of the city. I can see that change in elevation. It's the only place. I see all the way to the public square. It was a landform, and they were going to build over it and obscure it. Economics got in the way. They didn't listen to me a bit. I'm sure of it. But I think that's it. You know, here, they're so powerful. They're so in your face. But... I remember even a project, a design workshop, you know, where it was, we were doing this plan community and the, the landforms of each of the drainage areas as they fanned out and came into the base plane, um, you know, how to respect those. And, you know, so it can be really subtle. I, I think that's... So that grading class that you take from Keith Richardson it was Vern. Vern taught grading in, the, in those days. <laughs> yeah, grading is grading. Yes, has been always very important. Let's do one more question. 
Anyone? I'm going to add something. I think the oh, yeah. va value sure. of natural resources. I, you know, whenever I would talk about why did I go to school in Utah, you know, and it was, I don't know, I just used that. That's what stuck with me. And I think it was your brother so much that taught about natural resources. It gave us that language. Microclimate. Did you have a question over there? Did I see someone raise their hand? I, I'm yeah, here, let me bring you the mic. Okay, my question is kind of revolved around the idea that, um, I don't know, so obviously the professors change and like as the degree or profession changes, as time like evolves and the more we learn and the more software, I just kind of want to like ask like, did you feel prepared from what you learned here at Utah State? And was it like, did you feel like ready to go into the workforce per se? Yeah, I did. I did. I, you know, you, you started at the beginning. You know, you stippled drawings, you colored, you know, for years. <laughs> I had a rhythm to that. Um, but I, 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 this place gave me a confidence that I had never had before. And, you know, that, I can remember you know, several professors sort of saying to me, Patty, you need to work on your confidence. <laughs> um, and that's still always the criticism that I get. Um, I was just raised not to, you know, one day I just to say, go stick your feet in the creek. <laughs> that was his answer to everything. So, you know, I, I, having the confidence, but, no, you know, being able to speak up for nature, this place gave me that. You'll, you'll have that. I think that's... Uh, yeah, that's a nice <laughs> place to end, for sure. Let's give Patty another round of applause. Thank you. Thank you, guys.